Let's now please quiet our hearts as we prepare for worship in the Lord's name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. The first reading, Isaiah, verse 3 through 9. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, the first epistle, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the mystery or the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age for the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit." For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? 
it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Praise to you, O Christ. Please join us now as we sing the hymn of the day, hymn number 578 in the Lutheran service book, Thy Strong Word. That's hymn number 578 in the Lutheran service book. Followed by Pastor Robert Lent's sermon, Save to be Salt and Light, based on Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit to you, His beloved children, this morning. Our text for the message is our Gospel from Matthew chapter 5. When Armand and, and I attended seminary, we had to go through a lot of sermon classes, sermon delivery classes, sermon content, how to write a sermon. And throughout those years, the professors would stress again and again and again and again. Preach the law and the gospel. Law and gospel. You must have both law and gospel in your sermons. Not just law, not just gospel, but law and gospel. And our Lord in our text today does just that. He preaches and teaches law and gospel. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19 and 20 first. And there is where our Lord teaches and preaches law. The righteousness that is demanded by God from us. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. What Jesus says is that the demands of the law, that man, you and I, lead a holy and righteous life, will never be revoked. You know, we can speak about our little white lies we can feel that our life is not too bad. I'm better than they are. And I've certainly tried to please God. The scripture allows no exceptions to perfection. Just one infraction renders all of us sinners before God. Former holiness is of no avail to the present sinner. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus tells us that God demands absolute perfection. This is the demand or word or will of God which will never pass away. Jesus continues, Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus gives the clincher. If anyone misunderstood what he was saying before this point, they cannot miss it any longer. Jesus says, if you want to get into heaven by your own merit, by the life that you live before God, you will have to be more holy than the holy holies. That must have caused their hearts to sink. We should not forget that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were extremely holy people. Well, in an outward way. They were, in fact, the, the perfect example that Jesus could have used, the best earthly models of righteousness which Jesus could have pointed. And even though theirs was an outward, hypocritical holiness, well, the people couldn't see that. Only God could see that. They couldn't see that. And so Jesus puts that example up before them. Those people thought that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were the most holy, sinless people in the world. And now Jesus is saying, if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to be more holy and righteous than these people, the Pharisees and teachers of the law? The point of the verse is to show the people that they could not possibly keep God's law perfectly, which He demands, and so earn heaven that way. Jesus wants to shatter the opinion of His hearers to make them despair of ever saving themselves 
and to make them turn their attention to his perfect, saving righteousness. Well, that's the law. Oh, yeah, you can earn heaven if you are 100% perfect. That's the law. Never sin once from the time you're conceived to the time you die. Never do what God says don't do. And always do what he says you are to do. And you can get to heaven that way. We can't. And that's the law. The good news of our text this morning is that the perfect righteousness that is demanded by God has been fulfilled in our stead. Jesus would fulfill that law in our place perfectly with his own righteousness. In Jeremiah, Jesus is called the Lord our righteousness. In Matthew 3.15, in his baptism, Jesus said to John the Baptist, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And in our text, Jesus says this morning, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law does not and can never serve as the basis for salvation. Salvation has been accomplished by Christ's fulfillment of the law for us and by his suffering and death. Here Christ urges that the law be put into its proper perspective. Which means for us Christians now, that now being saved by our great God, by his mercy and grace, we now willingly, lovingly, cheerfully live for Christ and serve Him. And now Jesus proceeds to tell us some specific ways in which we are to serve Him in our love for Him. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown underfoot and trampled. The point of the comparison is the value of salt. Salt is good for something as long as it is salt. A similar truth applies to we Christians. We have a purpose in this world. We have of great value to our Lord and great value to this world if we fulfill the purpose for which Christ has given us. That purpose is to preserve and season the people of this world by the means of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If one does not do that as a Christian, then we are not fulfilling the number one purpose that God has given us to do. In ancient times, salt had great value and importance. Covenants were sealed with salt. The use of salt was used as a bond of fidelity or faithfulness, loyalty. Many ancient roads were built to accommodate the desire for salt. Cakes of salt were used as money. We are to be valuable like salt. Now salt, when it come and comes in contact with food, changes the food. Food does not change the salt. Christians, you and I and all Christians have the power to change people. That power is Christ living in us and the word which we proclaim. Jesus prayed, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus says that he wants you and me and all Christians to remain here in this world so that we can be the salt of the earth to change the world, to change the people in the world who are lost and dead in their sin by bringing them the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Salt preserves food. Salt was used to counteract decay. 
In his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, Luther has an excellent description of the action that we believers are to have as we carry out this function. By means of the law, we are to convict the world of sin. This activity is going to sting just like salt in a wound would sting. And of course, that stinging, that hurting that the law brings, it's not always appreciated, but it must be be done. Because if the gospel is not given first, the person will never see their sins, they'll never see their need for the Savior, and the gospel will fall on deaf ears. This must be done so that it's possible for us to season these people and flavor them with the sweetness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation. And Jesus promises his disciples that he will send them the Holy Spirit that will help them carry out this very ministry. And so our responsibilities to the world are to be understood in the terms of the qualities of salt. Strengthening, flavoring, preserving, purifying. The world needs the Christian for its betterment. And yet, we as Christians have the responsibility to retain our saltiness so we remain valuable and useful and can be that salt. Well, how do we retain that saltiness? By our commitment and the use of the Word and that sacrament. That's how our Lord comes to us and fills us and continues to, we might say, fill the salt shaker of our lives with salt through word and sacrament. Otherwise, we will lose our usefulness in the world in which we live. Then Jesus again says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light, people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so what's said about salt applies to light also. The purpose of light is to shine so that eyes may see. Wisdom would dictate not lighting the candle if one did not want to see. The same common sense applies to a city on a hill. Even if the city had only one light in it, people for miles around would be able to see it. The Christian is told by the Savior up front that we, if we are those lights that he has made us to be, we will be noticed by the world. But of course, it's not always going to be appreciated. Our visibility will force us sometimes to carry our crosses now and then, to suffer because we are being that salt and that light. The life and the work of the Christian, however, are not totally dreary. On the contrary, how privileged and honored are we to be that salt and light in the world, to serve our Lord who saved us, to serve Him this way. What a rewarding work to bring praise to God by our words and actions and by proclaiming Jesus the light of the world to that sin-darkened world. Now there are many passages of the Bible which use the idea of light in Psalm 119 comes to mind immediately. Your word is a light lamp to my feet, and a light for my path. The Word of God is light because it presents the Lord of life and light, Jesus Christ. Of Him, John said, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus says of Himself, I am the light of the world. And so it's a great privilege for the believer to reflect the glorious, saving light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has actually placed us up on a pedestal, not only to give us honor and to bless us, but to have us display His glory to all people as we bring them the glory 
salvation through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Only the word of God as it is communicated by you can do away with the darkness of this world. The darkness of sin and the satanic world. Not only does the world need to hear the verbal message of Christianity from you, good news of Jesus as the only Savior, but it also needs to see the embodiment of that message in our lives, in our actions. The Christian faith that's hidden and down in the valley of our own concerns and our own self-centeredness, well, what good does that do? It can't be seen. It's hidden in our own lives. And then there's our non-assertiveness of bringing that word to people. It's useless. Just as faith does not express itself, it's soon snuffed out. We are not to hide our faith. We are not to hide it so that people cannot see who we are and the one that we believe in. As a clean window lets the sunlight pour through it so that the room is bathed with its light, so Christians, by the clarity of their confession and the purity of our lives, let Christ shine through them so that the world might be flooded with that light, with the knowledge that in Christ there is salvation. Joe Delaney and his eight-year-old son Jared were playing catch in their backyard when Jared asked, Dad, is there a God? Joe replied that when he was younger, he did go to church a couple of times, but he really knew nothing about God. After a short while, Jared ran into the house yelling, I'll be right back. He had the helium-filled balloon he had gotten at the circus, a pen, and an index card. I'm going to send God an air mail message, he explained. He wrote, Dear God, if you are real, and if you are up there, send people who know you to Dad and me. As they were watching the balloon sail away, Joe thought, I hope you are real, and that you are watching God. Two days later, Joe and Jared pulled into a car wash sponsored by a church. When Joe asked the cost, he was told it's free, no strings attached. But why are you doing this, Joe inquired. We just want to show God's love in a practical way, he was told. So Joe asked, are you guys Christians? Do you believe in God? Both the answer was yes. That encounter led Joe and Jared to learn about Jesus Christ through the people at that church. But could it be that we at times have become a lighthouse without light? A girl from a wealthy home was converted to Christianity and for several years was a faithful witness to Christ. One day she was invited to stay with relatives whom she barely knew and whom she had actually never met. She decided that she would not make a point about having become a Christian. On the day she left a poised lady, an elderly relative of hers was walking with her and asked, By the way, where is your sister? And why didn't she come? I mean your religious sister. It was because I heard she was coming that I'm here. I'm sick of my empty life, and I so wanted to talk to a real Christian. We're lighthouses. We sometimes have no light. May God make us luminous Christians. That's what the light of Christ does for us, you know. Have you ever put a, a candle underneath an alabaster or onyx vase? This is commonly done in Egypt. When a light, when a candle is put inside, the whole thing becomes luminous. 
That's exactly what happens to us when Jesus Christ comes into our hearts. We become bright and luminous. And other people can find their way to God through the light that we shed. Again, Christ comes into us through word and His Holy Supper to enable us to be that light for Him. In the Middle Ages, people would gather at beautiful stained glass windows to look at the various scenes taken from the Bible and the great saints of the church. The people were illiterate and depended on the pictures to tell them the events and the truths of Scripture. One little boy recently asked his father on a vacation trip to Italy, while they were looking at these beautiful and breathtaking scenes on these stained glass windows, Dad, what's a saint? After thinking for a moment and staring up at the stained glass, the father smiled and looked at his son and said, A saint is someone whom the light shines through. You are those saints to whom the light shines through. You are the light today to a sin-dark world. Remember those commercials from Hotel 6? They would always end the commercial, we'll leave the light on. We will leave our light on. And it's good to note the way Jesus uses the words as he speaks to us as our Savior when he compares us with salt and light. He does not say, you will be or you may be or you ought to be salt and light. You are salt and light. It's the very nature of the Christian to speak for his Savior. The apostles declared, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. In joyful response to the God who has saved us and has given us heavenly glory waiting for us, our response must be, we cannot help but speak about what we've seen and heard. We cannot help but speak about the Savior who means the world and everything to us. We cannot help but be salt and light. To the glory of our great God and Savior. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Creed. I believe in God the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for sending Jesus to be the Savior of the world and for calling us into your kingdom that we, living by faith, would be salt and light to the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you on behalf of those needing care from your hands. We pray that you would grant renewed strength to those who are ill, hurting, and in need of physical comfort and he healing, especially Wilmer Burmeister, Alice Goodconnect, Diane Olson, Roberta Roach, Bob Schaefer, Donna Schenke, Ray Roach, Dwayne Schlobum, and all others in like circumstances whom we are not able to name by name. Lord, you are our great physician. We pray that you would continue to care for those we have in prayer entrusted into your hands, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, many are serving in the armed forces of our land, and the places of conflict seemingly continue to grow. We pray that you would continue to grant your protection for those who are serving, bless the labors of their hands so that greater peace and order would be restored, and that the violence of evil people would be curbed. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the church, you call workers into your harvest fields. We pray for your guidance on our Faribault Lutheran School principal, Mr. Joel Witt, as he wrestles with the three calls that he has received from other congregations and schools, and for Pastor Daniel Galchett, who has received the call to serve here as the senior pastor at Trinity. We pray, Lord, that by the work of your Holy Spirit, these servants would be led to decisions in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord of life, we thank you for the blessing that you will be giving to Matthew Joseph Crone as he receives the blessedness of the waters of new life in the sacrament of holy baptism following our 1030 service today. As he has been instructed in the faith, continue to bless his life of faith to continue to have him be light and salt to the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the comfort of the gospel to be in the lives of all who mourn the passing of Nikki Schultz. Turn all the eyes of all who mourn to the blessing of Christ's death and resurrection, to dry their tears and to give them hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those laboring to bring the gospel to the lost, especially Bobby and Tassany. Continue to provide opportunities for their Christian witness through their youth hospital, their recording studio, and through all the other labors of their hands. Bless the teaching and sharing of your word by all Christian missionaries everywhere. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, as your people come today with penitent hearts having seen their sin in the preaching of the law and having grasped the Holy Gospel in faith, we pray that you would grant unto us pardon and cleansing from our sins in this blessed sacrament, that you would strengthen our faith and that we would go forward with joy and with thanksgiving, knowing that Christ our Savior goes along with us. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Congregation may be seated.
you rise? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The sin of the Please join us in our hymns for distribution by listening or singing to hymn number 623 in the Lutheran service book, Lord Jesus Christ, We Humbly Pray. That's hymn number 623 in the Lutheran service book, followed by hymn number 411, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. That's hymn number 411 in the Lutheran service book. Again, those hymns are hymns number 623, followed by hymn number 411.
we come to the close of another worship service, we pray it will be a blessing to you and will strengthen your faith in Christ. This is a direct broadcast from the Trinity Lutheran Church here in Fairboat, Minnesota. This service broadcast this morning is given in thanksgiving for the 45th wedding anniversary of James and Carolyn Cross on February 8th. We also wish to thank the following. A gift to the Trinity Radio Club was given by Marion Hagel. In memory of Bernard Wagner, gifts were received to the Radio Club from Lewis and Arlene Rolf, Raymond and Donna Schenke, Laura Leet, William and Shar Scurry, Donald Burkesmeyer, Diane Bisbeen, Orville and Alvon Wagner, C. Elizabeth Goodnuck, Robert and Margaret Sander, and family and friends. Your prayers, gifts, letters, and cards are sincerely appreciated by the pastors and the members of the Trinity Radio Club who sponsor these broadcasts. Our speaker this morning was our pastor, the Reverend Robert Lentz. Our presiding pastor was our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Armour J. Bomey. Our organist this morning is Mrs. Barbara Morosco. We return you now to the main studios of KDHL until next Sunday at 8 a.m.